Good morning, I'm Sarah Wheaton, Senior Health Reporter with Politico, and welcome to the second day of our fifth healthcare summit. I'm coming to you live from Auto World in Brussels, and I'm really sad that you all are not here with me, but for really early morning starts like this one, the advantage of not being in person is that you can have a giant mug of coffee and you don't have to worry about stepping over other people in the aisle and spilling it all over them. So I hope you're taking advantage of that virtual coffee or tea um, toast to you. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you for waking up early um, and joining us, and I'd like to particularly thank our presenting partners, Roche and Lilly, our supporting organizations, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, and the European Patients Forum. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. You can ask questions only through the SwapCard app, and the easiest way to get to that is through the box under or next to the live stream, live, uh, next to the live stream, excuse me. Um, and make sure that you find the section titled questions. Um, that's the way that we will see them. Um, and uh, we wanna make this event as interactive as possible as usual, so don't hesitate to ask questions and tweet about this event using, using the hashtag Politico Healthcare. And now to start the, the second day of our summit, um, I'd like to first actually do a quick recap of yesterday. We had the commission's Olga Solomon talking a bit about the possibility of tying incentives to um, fulfilling un unmet needs and making those available around the block. Um, we also heard about ongoing challenges um, with the medical device regulations. Turns out the one year delay uh, isn't solving all the problems. And we also heard from David Nabarro, uh, who's the World Health Organization's main envoy on the coronavirus, that it's going to take another year, even though we have some very promising vaccines in the pipeline, it's going to take a year before it is finally uh, introduced to the general population. And that means that the mitigation measures, such as we're doing right now, are going to continue for about a year. And that's why I'm really thrilled to have our next guest, Swedish Health Minister Lena Hollengren. Sweden has always tried to kind of find a middle ground. And early on, the sort of reputation that, that was spreading out in the rest of the world was that Sweden was pursuing this sort of herd immunity strategy. It came in for some criticism, but it's also been praised by the World Organization as, as striking the right balance. Um, at the same time, we do still see, as late as October, we heard some, some critiques in, in a big article in Science um, from Swedish scientists. So, I'm super happy to have Minister Hollingren here to clear some things up. Um, Minister Hollingren, thanks so much for joining us. Um, just let's, let's address the big issue. Is it accurate to say that Sweden was, was pursuing at one point a herd immunity strategy? No. So how do you, how do you think this, uh, this uh, kind of ended up being the perception? And what, 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 how would you describe it? Of course, we don't need that kind of rumors because that's what it is. Uh, and we are trying to fight the pandemic as well as other countries. We're fighting extremely hard. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think I'm one of the health ministers in the world with the uh, most international interviews during this pandemic, uh, talking about my country's strategy uh, without everyone really knowing so much about our system, uh, our healthcare system, uh, about uh, how we use our public health agency, 
uh, how we use legally binding measures, how we recommend uh, in, in different ways to try to change people's behaviors. So, of course, when we have this kind of, as I really want to say rumors, because we never had that kind of uh, herd immunity in our strategy, we tried to, 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 to explain that in, in many ways and from many different people. Uh, but of course, that can make it a little bit more difficult within the country to make people realize because they, of course, follow the Swedish media, uh, the press conference and everything. But they also, uh, they're also, um, of course, listening and, and uh, uh, reached, are reached by the international media and, and their, their headlines. So, uh, well. Right. And, and so do you oh, now feel okay. that that Sweden's approach has been vindicated to some extent? Honestly, from the beginning, we had no, uh, of course, uh, that was not my idea. That was not the idea from the government to be in any particular way, try to be uh, unique or have a, a strategy that were, um, that, that other people in, in other countries will, will give that kind of attention to. So I'm a bit surprised, really, about that. Uh, but, um, well, uh, we had a strategy which we found was the best for Sweden to try to tackle uh, the situation, to try to fight the virus, uh, try to stop it from being spread in society, save people's life and health, uh, make sure that we have a healthcare sector trying uh, or being able to cope with uh, the situation. Uh, so um, we have done that. And the first month, uh, we have. I think we have a freeze. Sorry, uh, you said that you were saying the yeah. first month you had. Yeah, the first month from the beginning. I mean, what we had, as I said before, attention drawn mm -hmm. to Sweden. Uh, we had a situation which was, uh, I mean, we didn't have the kind of lockdown full or forced as many countries did choose, uh, but we did, we did manage to change the behavior of the Swedish population. We changed our everyday life radically, I would say over a night. And that's what we try to reach. Uh, this is not a competition who has the, the toughest uh, measures, but we are of course uh, very eager to, to make sure that people uh, keep the physical distance, that they stay home with the slightest symptoms, that they have a good hand hygiene, uh, and of course, that we um, make sure that that kind of different kind of uh, risky environments where we know that COVID-19 is um, being spread, uh, highly being spread, the restaurants, the, the, the cultural events, the sports events, the, the, uh, the schools, uh, not the, the primary schools, but the, the upper secondary and the universities, they were closed. So we had many changes. Uh, and I think it has been quite difficult many times to discuss the lockdown because it means so uh, different, mm. uh, has a different meaning in different countries, depending mm. on what kind of measures you took and, and uh, many times also connected to what kind of effect you got. Right. And why do you think Sweden was more successful at getting people to change their behavior without using kind of a harsh enforcement. Could this be replicated elsewhere? Or are there things sort of inherent in the Swedish system or culture that would take a long time to copy? Impossible for me to say, but I guess we will see lots of evaluation and then people will make some research about this pandemic, of course, not only about the virus, but behavior of people. Uh, I don't know if other countries, how they how should I say, I mean, did they decide to have different kind of lockdowns or did they consider other kinds of, of measures? Uh, for us, it was very important that we really try to have the right measure at the right time. And now we also try to, to have it a bit different maybe over the country because we're different hit over the country. So, well, I don't know. I'm interested in, in the answers of that question myself. Mm -hmm. And... At this point, we're now talking increasingly about the other effects of the coronavirus, whether it's delayed diagnosis, mental health challenges. 
are you at the point where you're able to really kind of focus on these issues and, and what are you doing to, to look at health broadly beyond this particular infectious disease? Well, we had a, a, a very tough uh, situation for the healthcare sector during spring. Uh, they uh, not just double, but maybe triple the, the ICU places. Uh, they had to work a lot. And fortunately, when we get to the summer, we had an effort, uh, a more positive um, situation uh, considering the spread of the virus. And that was very, everyone, of course, ha had some time off the pandemic, you can say. And I hope that people also in the healthcare sector had some, had some vacation. But really, uh, just at the beginning of, of the autumn, they have a situation where they're going back to work, not just trying to deal with all the, uh, the needs in the healthcare sector that had to be postponed because we have to deal with the COVID. But now we're in a, in a, in a second wave, I would say, uh, since a few weeks ago. So now we are uh, not doubling the ICU places yet, but it's, it's more... Uh, it's very, it's a very tough situation that we're going into. Once again, we don't know where it's ending, but of course we're prepared for a situation, uh, and that means that they have to deal with COVID, they have to deal with other issues, as you say, um, and that means not only the the postponed part of of the healthcare, but also the maybe the mental health, the the issue that people didn't they didn't uh, look for healthcare. Uh, in the same extent that they did as they used to do. So we don't know what that has done with the, the, the public health, really. Uh, we have to see for that. But at the same time, the people working in the healthcare sector, they are they are more tired this time. And I think that is something uh, other countries will recognize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and on that note of other countries, um, I'm curious what your take on the on the EU level response has been. We just saw the Commission put out last week a proposal for a European Health Union. They envision sort of um, a bit more enforcement of, of data sharing, an empowered European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which which has its seat in in your country. So um, I wonder, uh, you know, are are you ready to embrace the Commission's proposals? Do you want do you want to see them do more, or do you think that they're pushing a bit too much on uh, national authority for health? Interesting question, of course, but I think it's important to say that uh, it's important that that the Commission, of course, is is supporting the member states. But uh, I think that is very at the same time important that each country really uh, have their competence. And I'm not ready to switch any of that. Uh, I think it's important that we have the parts very important for for the European Union. Uh, I mean. Just look upon the, the common market, uh, uh, the situation we had at the beginning of the pandemic with the closed borders, that was such a, a I don't know, problem. Uh, that was a small catastrophe, I would say, that uh, people did close the borders. They kept uh, not only the PPE, but other, other um, uh, products, uh, medical um, ventilators or whatever, which made the... the uh, the dealing with the pandemic so much more difficult. And I think it's important that um, what, what we have been, uh, what has been connecting us uh, in the European Union, that, that has to be working, uh, even if it's a situation with a crisis and this time it's a pandemic. Um, so I think we have to make sure that the fundamenta is in place and working uh, both in crisis and, and in, in, in ordinary times. But when it comes to the situation where we are being supported, I mean, a good example, of course, is that we are cooperating extremely well when it gets to the vaccine. Sweden is one of the countries negotiating for, for different uh, agreements with the vaccine uh, candidates. Uh, that, that's very good because I think each country is too small. But, but other issues, I mean, we have different kind of system. The healthcare is is not a particularly uh, uh, a competence for European Union. I think it's important that it's it stayed that way, but with with cooperation, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let me ask maybe a little bit more of um, 
I wouldn't say a philosophical or a personal question, but something um, that sort of gets at maybe a little bit more of um, an emotional issue. A colleague commented that now must be, uh, it's never easy to be a leader, but now must be especially an especially difficult time to be um, in political or policy leadership because there are so many wrenching choices to be made, even, even if you're not forcibly closing shops and restaurants, you know, telling people that, hey, you need to change your, change your behavior, um, be in a position where you're going to be making less money, um, and do this for a long period of time. You're, you're asking people to make really hard choices, and, and sometimes you, you, know, you have to decide between two very compelling arguments about what kind of human needs are. And how have you been approaching these tough decisions? Many questions in one, because, <laughs> uh, I mean, the very close um, relation, dialogue uh, that we have with our public health agency uh, to make sure that we really have uh, measures taken, which we know is I mean, they are not politically, uh, I would say they are more like, I mean, we are relying very much on our health agency. And of course, it's the government responsible for what we're doing, what steps we're taking, uh, uh, the different measures we're taking in, in, a, in a way to, to try to, um, I mean, 200 billion Swedish crowns has been used so far to try to mildra, to mitigate uh, the consequences of, of, uh, of the pandemic, of the decisions we have to make. Uh, but at the same time, we cannot say that people's life and health are compared to the economical efforts we're making. We have to put life and health first, and then we're trying to, in the best way we can, to to mitigate with the consequences. Um, I think it's some kind of a difference. I don't know what, what other countries and, and, and governments uh, consider about that, but in, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, it was more like everyone were very united in what to do. Then we had this summer and beginning of autumn. Uh, many people felt that the pandemic, even if we say this will last for a long time, it's still in our society. Many people felt that I think it's almost gone. Uh, they didn't go back to normal, but they changed their life a, a bit in a more normal way. And now we have a situation where we don't have that kind of, I mean, we have a great support for, for the strategy, for the, the, the way we're working as a government, but 70% of the people think that this is the right way to, to go. Um, but at the same time, I mean, now we have more of a debate and discussion, should we do that? Should we do something else? Uh, more lessons learned from, from the first part of the pandemic from other countries. So I would say it's, it's a little bit more difficult now because uh, many people are in, in the debate and the discussion with different perspectives, but we will continue to put life and health at first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do have um, some questions from the audience. So, um, and we have about a minute left, so I'll, I'll ask you quickly. Um, could you explain to us the role of primary health care in the management of the pandemic? Well, uh, the primary health care uh, is widely spread all over the country. And I would say that the digital visits have increased, I think in one of our regions with 1000% uh, uh, because uh, we need to have more uh, opportunities to, to use the digital visit and contacts with the healthcare. Uh, I think they, um, of course it's important when it comes to, to the testing part, when it comes to, um, Trying, trying to meet people uh, and, and not uh, if they don't need the, the, the hospital care. But um, I in this pandemic, I would say that the testing is not always connected to the primary care uh, centers, uh, but they're more widely spread. And uh, many people, when they are in need of health care, I mean, it, it is the hospital and the intensive care that are being mostly stressed. So. Um, 
not so much more to say than that, but uh, the interesting evaluation of the digital visits, that is something that we've seen. And we'll try to, to, to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'm really glad that you mentioned digital visits because our next panel is actually about um, the future of health data in the EU, EU and digitization. So Minister Hallengren, thank you so much for joining us first thing this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks so much to our audience. Said on the future. Hope you can hear me. Um, so the next session is uh, at nine o'clock. Um, so please stay connected. And again, in case it got um, lost in the tech issue, um, it's about the future of health data in the EU. See you. See you very soon.